political clientelism, it's not like this, but it is about the like dispersion of the population. So there are uh, um, different uh, small, uh, small concentrations of uh, uh, people, of uh, communities. So some of them are small communities and they, they need uh, to have a school in there. Yeah, because it is the, the other school or the other community is too far away. So I, when I was in the school myself, I had to, 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 to walk almost two hours to get the, the school. Yeah, the school with, uh, it was, it was a pluridocente. It had five professors at that time in the, the parroquia, the small town. So, but the government wants to, has the plan to reduce the number of the schools to 560, uh, 5, uh, well equipped schools, which is nice. So the, intentionally, the intention is very nice. But, but uh, there are communities the, which are st uh, still isolated communities. So they, they can't go to the schools of the millennium or the, the bigger schools where they can found a very nice school, well equipped, etc. So it's very far away. So this, this reality did not disappear. And then with uh, um, millennium schools, which will not uh, be a solution, will not be a solution for this thing. And then it's uh, good, good intentions, bad understandings of the complexity behind of these kind of schools. Um, and these this schools, of course, are Quichua, um, peasants, or Quichua, or Shuar schools. And most of them are indigenous, uh, are attending to, or serving to indigenous children in the country. So the, um, the, uh, in the schools of the millennium and then the other schools, the government provide uh, uniforms, uniforms gratis, so that's the uniform, so free, so uh, free clothes for, for children. And uh, it's for urban and uh, rural schools. Yeah, sometimes in the rural schools, uh, they offer so some uh, stylized, uh, standardized indigenous clothes. So it is the, the, the true, truly interculturality, yeah, um, this kind of stylized uh, uh, clothes for indigenous. Yeah? And then the curriculum is uh, unique, so it's standardized. Um, one curriculum for the total of schools in the country. And then the no room for indigenous language, so knowledge, as I show you, that the bilingualism is not part of the official concerns. And the emphasis, the emphasis um, is on interculturality. So that's the official, official discourse, discourse. Interculturality, because, but without language. So it is prohibited to speak about the language. But it is nice to talk about interculturality. So we have to relate each other. The languages are just dividing us. So it is a, the simonic construction of nation. So, con so some conclusions. So the bilingual education in Ecuador has been a grassroots movement a project. Yeah, a project from, from below, even though there was some interest from, from uh, above, but with different uh, conceptions and uh, perception of the indigenous uh, cultures and language. So currently there, are, there is a fundamental contradiction between official discourses about education, bilingual education and the real practices in the schools. Yeah, the great investments in education are focused on infrastructure and equipment, but not in teacher training, neither relevant curriculum according to cultural and linguistic characteristics of the society, and as it is established in the, in the constitution and the legal, legal uh, frame. Yeah, so the uh, government uh, has uh, uh, dismantling, this is, uh, dismantling the institutos normales bilingües. So all of the institutos, the institutes I talked to you, were just closed or changed, uh, changed its, uh, their status. Yeah, they became um, um, institutos tecnológicos, but which is not uh, concerned about education, but any, uh, about any other uh, careers or um, uh, um, possibly relevant to the region, but not teacher education. Yeah, so the discourse of interculturality is being used to cover the real linguistic policies of indigenous language shift throughout the country. So um, 
the institutes so some 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 numbers, right? So the uh, school uh, school teachers uh, educated in the institutes normales were um, in the last five years were uh, very interesting. Yeah, so you can see the the numbers in there, and then the the the, the total. And even though we have the uh, bilingual institutes, institutes, uh, there were a very chronic uh, deficit of bilingual teachers in the country. Yeah, but now all of these institutos bilingües yeah, have been closed. Yeah, there is there is not any any system of uh, education of uh, teacher education in the country, and the universities are not offering any program for. Um, um, uh, teacher education and bilingual education, etc. Yeah, okay, so there's some information about the bilingualism uh, of uh, students and uh, the institutes and, uh, yeah, okay. So there is, um, this is about the perception, perception of, uh, of uh, the language, so, sorry, it's in Spanish. So it's uh, about the future expectations about the language yeah, ask to the students of uh, the uh, institutos uh, pedagogicos bilingües. So I, I made um, uh, research in the institutos, and they believe the, uh, this about the future of the language. So it is very, very interesting because it is uh, the highest um, appreciation is the, the, the Spanish as well as the Quichua or Shuar language are very important in the future, right? So it's a great, great importance. Yeah, 42% uh, and 47%, so the Quechua, Quechua language. So this is what the students and the youth, uh, youth students believe about the language. So uh, it, is, uh, it is interesting because uh, there, is a, there is a nice uh, scenario um, to, uh, to, teach, to teach the language. So um, the language shift and the indigenous knowledge weakening. So um, in this moment, so there are, there are, there are some, some elements as to, th to think uh, about and to be worried about the, the language, uh, indigenous language. So the first thing I, I was able to, to, to see is the dynamic relations between uh, cities and rural communities. So before there were, um, there were uh, uh, far away located communities and uh, the uh, comuneros, uh, people from communities have to use Spanish only when they go to the cities. And then they return to the communities and Quechua or any uh, the other, the other language were used every day in the uh, social uh, interactions. But now it, it is not happening anymore. Yeah? Um, and then there is an expansion of state services, yeah, yeah, especially the electricity. And with the electricity um, um, goes the TV. So you can find a TV, uh, a TV in, any, in every house in the, in the countryside. And what, me, what it means, it is Spanish presence in the community, in the, in the, uh, at home. Yeah? So children spend a lot of time yeah, watching TV in Spanish. And then little by little, yeah, the children and parents uh, use more Spanish, more Spanish, more Spanish in the co early co communication. So there is nothing in Quechua and in, in, in TV programs, nothing, absolutely. So the state discourses impact on community way of life. So there are many services, uh, many services, many uh, state of uh, uh, officials going to the communities to talk about the children's rights, the uh, uh, youth rights, um, etc. And they are doing all of this in Spanish. In Spanish, uh, mass media, mass media, and monolingualism. So I already said that the TV and the, the other mass media in general they are monolingual, monolingual. So this model of um, frame the uses of language and the symbolic. Uh, symbolic meaning of the language. So the children do not speak indigenous language anymore. So I, I, I saw myself in the two years ago when I was in the community. So in every house, the children are speaking just in Spanish. And, and they, don't, they don't understand Quechua. 
No, they don't understand Quechua. So, in this context, the bilingual schools uh, are not uh, uh, factors or elements to maintain the language as it was. Uh, it was before, or 20 years or more before. Yeah, the bilingual schools are uh, factors for revitalization of indigenous languages. It is an imperative. We need this in this moment. But under this government, we have nothing. Absolutely. So uh, it is, um, there are uh, very uh, huge challenges for indigenous communities in order to, to reinvent the discourse about the bilingual education, uh, bilingual education, and uh, um, uh, imagine um, initiative, uh, any initiatives to supporting the language in the, in the communities, in the, in the houses, and in, uh, by using it in the uh, everyday communication in the community, because in the schools we can't expect anything while Korea are in the, in the power. Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Sam. Yeah. yeah thank you for a very interesting presentation. Oh, yeah. So, so, sorry. Sorry about that. I want to ask a question. <laughs> yeah. Um, the future of bilingualism, why don't, since you're a specialist in bilingual education, it would be interesting to form a sort of like an association like, for instance, uh, what uh, children, Jewish children do in the United mm -hmm. States. They had Hebrew school. Mm -hmm. It's called Hebrew free school. And they, they teach the language, but they take it out of their pockets, and the, and the children uh, help support the teachers. Uh, and then my, own, my, my, my other comment was, you know, the, the, the thing of uh, not using that book anymore or throwing that book away, uh, the same thing happened in Arizona. Mm -hmm. They had an ethnic studies program. They developed fantastic readers for the children mm -hmm. that were able to motivate them to study, and they actually scored higher grades than in other schools in, 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 in the regular uh, mm -hmm. state examinations, etc. But they said they were politicizing the children, mm -hmm. as if teaching in, in English isn't politicizing them. <laughs> mm -hmm. right? it's, the same, it's, it was, it's actually the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, as a bilingual educator, what do you think your future is in, in uh, Ecuador? What do you plan to do when you go back? I, 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 was, I was trying to, to, to work with... Um, so, there, there is, a, there is a, in this moment, there is a crisis within the indigenous organizations. So, I think there is a crisis of um, collective identity. So, there is not... A, belonging, very strong belonging sense. So um, the uh, indigenous youth has um, um, access to higher education or in general to the, to the education, but as the uh, indigenous organizations are very weak, uh, disarticulated in this last year, so the uh, youth has not any 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 sense as to to keep thinking themselves as a, as, a, as indigenous, mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it is uh, one one of uh, uh, problematic things. So I was trying to work with uh, with uh, with uh, young people, with young people, as to reflect about our history, our culture, our language, and to use it, to use it, yeah, and how to use the language. So the other thing is to work with uh, professors, yeah. Yeah, it will be fine, but you can't do anything from outside because everything is controlled by the government. So you can't you can't use uh, any other resources than the, those provided by the government. So if you organize a, a foundation or an institution of uh, uh, yeah, as to support the bilingual education, the government do not permit to talk to the professor. So you have to. To, to, to ask permission, but he doesn't permit you. So uh, even, even to the, 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 the parents can't decide about their, their children. So there, there was a case in Otavalo. So there, was a, 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 there is a circuit uh, very close to Otavalo, you know this. Uh, the, the, the matrix, the school, the matrix school was located in San Pablo. Yeah, That's, uh, and then, uh, Children from Peguche has to 
the children have to come to the San Pablo schools. But it's difficult. So there is not bus, uh, bus there is not uh, any services as to move the students from Peguche to San Pablo. Mm -hmm. So the parents wanted to, 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 to take their children and put them in another school in Otavalo, which is much closer. But the government did not permit to take children, even to their parents. So it is, it is difficult in this moment to, to, think, to, to think something. So I was trying to influence in the government so by preparing uh, some proposals, but nobody are interested in bilingual education. So I think there is, there is a hidden, hidden agenda or a hidden goals are to, as to, to erase the indigenous, indigenous language from the country. Yeah, so uh, it, it is, it is, it is, it is terrible. It is terrible. Hmm? Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. I'll go to your. Okay. Okay. If you need to. Get a drink of water, go to the restroom. It's not on. It's okay. It's okay. I'll turn it on. It's okay. Yeah, I will. Push the mute. Okay. Okay. Oh, we're going to. Hello? Yeah. We're going to start in about five minutes. So this is the five. Um, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm Barbara Nichols, and I'm the president of the UNA USA Dane County chapter, and uh, proud to bring to your attention that the Dane County UNA USA chapter has been a continuous member of the United Nations since 1945 when it was founded. So we're one of the oldest continuous yes. chapters. Good yes, good for us. Um, just a brief comment about the UN. Uh, the United Nations is an international organization which was founded in 1945 after the Second World War. And it's committed to maintaining international peace and security. Uh, the work of the United Nations reaches the globe. And although it's best known for peacekeeping and peace building and conflict prevention, the UN has four main purposes. To keep peace throughout the world, to develop friendly relations among nations, to help nations work together to improve the lives of poor people, to conquer hunger, to conquer disease, to conquer illiteracy, and to encourage respect and dignity for each other's rights and freedoms, and to be a center for harmonizing the actions of nations to achieve these goals. Our local chapter uh, advocates for these principles of the UN, and we do that in three ways. We have an ongoing lecture series that runs from September through June, in which we pick a topic that is relevant to issues that the UN is dealing with. We partner with other groups in Madison dealing with these four main purposes of the UN, peacekeeping and dealing with other areas. Our theme uh, this year and, and our final program is we celebrate annually uh, United Nations Day, which is the 24th of October. Uh, and that's uh, what we advocate for. It's a way to bring public attention to the ongoing work of the United Nations. Our program themes this year have been on water, water safety. That's what's left of my New England accent, water. <laughs> Uh, if you don't know what I'm saying, <laughs> W-A-T-E-R, <laughs> uh, water safety and uh, sustainable uh, food and environments. Um, also, uh, we have been concerned with refugees. So before I introduce uh, the context for which our speaker will be speaking, since today is November 11th, Armistice Day, which commemorates uh, the end of World War I, uh, before I was born. I know I'm as old as dirt, but not as old as World War I, 1918, I believe it ended. 
uh, let's take a moment of silence for all the veterans who have served in wars. This evening, uh, in acknowledging uh, 2014 uh, International Year of Solidarity with the pa Palestinian people, has been one of the international years that the United Nations has created. The United Nations every week has a year celebration of some event. And in uh, 2014, we are also then celebrating the International Year of Solidarity with the Palestinian people. Just a brief historical context. When the United Nations was founded in 1945, the territory of Palestine was still, still administered by the United Kingdom and Northern Ireland. And the seminal issue of debate, which began in 1945 and is still ongoing, was how to create an Arab state and a Jewish state, which would involve Jews in Palestine and Arabs, uh, in, is and, and Arabs in Israel. As you know, uh, since that time, there have been wars, dispute, and struggles, and many, many, many refugees. And so here to share with us tonight uh, on the ground experience of what is happening uh, in Palestine is our speaker. Um, he will be introduced by Joan Deming. You can, yes. This, uh, this room, this, this program, December 9th, Chris Watley, who's the executive director of the United Nations Association, is speaking here on a human rights theme, and that's very exciting. Right, since December 17th is International Human Rights Day. Joe. So we'll start tonight on human rights in Palestine and then broaden it to human rights in general in next month. Um, I'm Joan Deming. I am really pleased to be here with you and have been an on and on again, off again, um, not very present, but, but definitely um, thinking uh, along the lines of UN support for, uh, for many years. And I come from parents who were lifelong UNA members, so it's, it's very good to be with you this evening. I am a United Methodist ordained pastor, but I've been working for um, the last years last seven years as the executive director of an organization called Pilgrims of Ibeline. Uh, Ibeline is a village in the northern part of the present day state of Israel, but historic Palestine. Ibeline is a Palestinian village where a Palestinian priest, Father Elias Shakur, started schools for um, Palestinian uh, Muslim and Christian and Druze students and the faculty has al always also included Jewish teachers in addition to the Jewish or the Christian Muslim and Druze uh, teachers. For a while in their history they even had some Jewish students but no longer. Uh, our partnership in expanded a few years ago beyond the schools in Ibeline to uh, several other peace making organizations in the West Bank and in Israel. And one of those wonderful organizations is represented tonight by uh, the director and founder of the organization. The organization is We Am, and our guest speaker tonight is Zubi Zubi from Bethlehem. Um, we Am is a Palestinian conflict resolution center. Um, they practice a Palestinian version of um, of mediation and uh, teach peer mediation to students and to um, 
women and uh, members of the community, but also Zubi and some of his colleagues are actively involved in mediating disputes and, and um, some of the, the many uh, difficulties and conflicts that arise when people live in a pressure cooker of a situation where um, every day just the challenges of getting up and going through the day inc include humiliations and um, being sidetracked and having roadblocks literally and figuratively put in front of you. And, um, and living with that causes uh, physical uh, problems, but also emotional and spiritual problems. And so all of those are dealt with um, by the, the leaders and mediators of, of We Am, the Conflict Resolution Center. We Am is an Arabic word that means cordial relationships or cordial relations between people. And uh, in addition to doing the mediating, we Am also offers training for, uh, for children, youth, women, men, um, groups, individuals, in order to uh, help them know their full rights as human beings and, as, uh, and especially their rights in a complicated legal situation where many rights have been taken away, but some still exist. Uh, and, um, and teaching nonviolent methods of resistance and of maintaining a hold on, on one's humanity and the grace of, of living together, a belief that there can be a beautiful life together that uh, even expands beyond um, what, ex what people experience.